Welcome back, part two. This video explores the approach we take once we make a commitment to support someone. Once we commit to being part of the change that's designed to improve a situation for a vulnerable person or family. Whatever our role, we need to keep a close eye on. The underlying principles of our approach, the skills we use in our conversation, and the overall outcome the person is seeking to achieve. So hold some principles in mind. You know, as human beings, accepting help or living with hardship, making changes in our lifestyle or doing things differently or present a challenge. We need to understand that and accommodate in it in our thinking about people. For example, think about a change you've tried to make. Getting a better work-life balance, eating more healthily, doing more exercise, having improved conversations with your children, visiting elderly relatives more often, or learning a new skill. Maybe these are just my regular aspirations. You may have a different or similar list. I know why these things are important to me, but I often fall short in my hopes to achieve them. We all know how things might improve our lives, but they're hard to do. And if we, even if we did make a commitment to those things, it would be hard often to keep them going. So if we know this about ourselves, why would we expect others just to get on with doing things differently? People will falter along the way. So expect some ups and downs. Try not to tell people what to do. Instead, help them to come up with their own solutions and be genuinely impressed if or when they manage to put those ideas into action. As we continue to support people, we need to continue to have conversations about the hopes and the aspirations they have. We also need to recognise the challenges they face and acknowledge their strengths in facing them and overcoming them. Often people do not see themselves as we see them. So if we've noticed them for their strength, their kindness, their love, their humour, their skill, their commitment or their openness, we need to try and find the words to let them know what we've noticed. Over time, it becomes easier for them to recognise those qualities in themselves and to use them to overcome their own difficulties and manage their own risks. Problems deficits, weaknesses, are often easier to find in ourselves and in others. And if we focus only on those things, over time there's a risk they become who we are. We all have to work hard to see strengths and find the right words to let people know what we've noticed in them. If we are focusing on this, these skills, it's less likely that we'll fall into other conversational traps. Here are some of them that are commonly described. Firstly, the expert trap, thinking we need to fix this with our knowledge and expertise and not listening hard enough to what they know and they think. They're the experts in their lives. Or the problem solving trap, we come up with all the ideas, often setting people up to fail or at least eliciting a response from them of, yes, but I can't do that because. Often jumping to service solutions too soon. Hearing ourselves trying to suggest, have you tried such and such? Instead of asking, what have you tried and how did it help? Sometimes confronting people when we're very concerned. Don't you realise what will happen if you're not careful? Instead of, what are you most worried about happening if this continues? And the trap of 
telling people it will be okay, instead of listening to their worst fears. These are very human reactions. We all do these things. Because we care, and especially when under pressure or desperate to make things better. We need to be kind to ourselves, but notice when we're falling into the traps and try and do something different. So the skills we draw on, listen hard to understand, notice and reflect on strengths. Use exploring questions to try and understand, help people think and talk, and use our summarising skills. Listen hard to understand. Notice and reflect on strengths. Keep wondering what's going on in their minds, rather than saying what's going on in yours. Then find the right words to reflect what you genuinely notice. Here are some examples. You never complain, whatever the world throws at you. Or you never give up and you won't be told what to do. Or your kind heart shines through even when you're putting on a tough exterior. To get a clear insight into strengths, it sometimes helps to draw a strengths map. So if you have a moment, draw a picture of the person you're working with. Now draw in all the pe people in their lives that you know about. Then write words on the page that describe their strengths. Think from their point of view, not just yours. Funny, clever, loving, insightful, loyal tenacious, kind. Think about the different things they bring to the network. They may bring practical support, emotional support. They may be a role model, a rule keeper or a fun maker. Also think of the strengths of the environment, the home, the community, the networks, the world around them. This helps us to get a better picture of the strengths and resources and resilience within the people we're working with. But we can also use exploring questions. What's the best thing about what you've done this week? Or who or what helps you most when you feel down? Or what is it you say to yourself that keeps you going? Or recognise their challenges. What scares you most if nothing changes? Or their hopes? What would your world look like if things were better? Be clear that you both share a vision of how things would be if they were better. The following example is a paragraph that captures someone's hopes and aspirations. I would be managing my sadness by talking to people I trust rather than drinking. I would be supporting my son by caring for my grandchildren when he works and I would be spending time in the garden I love. Whatever role you play, keep a clear eye on the outcome and remember, your conversation really matters.